Good morning and welcome to Sunday School at First Baptist Church. I'm so glad that you can be with us today as we take uh, a look at session 10 uh, in the book of Proverbs. We'll be a pretty big chunk of uh, literature here today, but we won't touch on every verse. Chapter 24 through 29, signs of a disciplined life. And the idea here is that it takes discipline to live the right kind of life. It takes discipline to walk down the right path. Uh, the portion of book of Proverbs that we're looking at here uh, is uh, in large part uh, a group of Proverbs that were collected uh, of Solomon by Hezekiah's scribes. They're called Hezekiah's men. In fact, uh, it says that, that they were the people who were responsible for collecting these Proverbs. Uh, the the uh, the, the idea here is that uh, these Proverbs were collected and put together during Hezekiah's reign. And Hezekiah's reign, I, I want to talk about just a little bit before we start because I think it's an important thing for us to know. It was a reign that, uh, uh, that was one of the good, good kings of Israel. In fact, the, the Bible always tells us who the good kings were and who the bad kings were. It always labels the kings of Israel. And if you look in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, there's a description here at the very beginning of Hezekiah's reign, and it gives the, the whole tone for what his reign as king was like. Chapter 29, verse 1 says, Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah and the, was the daughter of Zechariah, and he, she, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. That's the important part. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. According to all that David, his father, his forefather, had done. Look at what he did. <clears throat> the first thing that he did was to cleanse the temple. In the first year of his reign, the first month, he opened doors to the house of the Lord and he repaired them. This story is heard over and over in Israel. Hezekiah was one of the ones who who repaired the temple and put it back in place. He brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east and said to them, Hear me, Levites. Now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of our fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what is evil in the sight of the Lord. They have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. And then they got to work, and they did what Hezekiah wanted them to do. You may also recall that it was in Hezekiah's reign that uh, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came and surrounded Jerusalem. And uh, he wrote a bunch of uh, demands to Hezekiah and sent them in, and, and he, he made a lot of curses on Yahweh. And Hezekiah went in and laid it on the altar. He said, God, this is what these people have said about you. This is what they've done. That night, God sent the angel of, of death across the Assyrian camp, and they uh, lost over 100,000 men. In fact, I think it was about 120,000, and they had to go home uh, in disgrace. And Sennacherib met his death when he came, got back home. This was the man of God. This was a king, a good king, who did what he was supposed to. And he collected the, most of this group of Proverbs that had been written by Solomon. And, and I share that with you uh, so that you understand, he's a person again, like in our lesson last Sunday, Daniel was. Hezekiah was a person who wanted to follow the way. Perhaps he had been taught the way, we're not sure. I'm pretty sure Daniel was, but Hezekiah maybe not. But he got it from somewhere. And he wanted to share it with a whole group of people. So with that, I want to begin with this statement. And it's a statement that's going to be important throughout the lesson, especially at the end. And from one of the commentators that I read, here's what it is. We cannot expect more righteousness of our children than we demonstrate to them in our daily lives. I have entitled this lesson, Signs of a Disciplined Life. 
And if we as adults, as parents, if we don't demonstrate the path, the right way of living, how can we expect those who come after us to demonstrate that same thing? To have the discipline in their life to, to, to live in the right way and to walk down the path and not stray from it. That's important for us to remember as we look at all of these verses today. We're going to begin by looking at one of the favorite topics of the writers of Proverbs, and that's laziness. Laziness. This passage in Proverbs 24, beginning with verse 30, talks about the sluggard. Um, it, it's an interesting word. It's not one that you hear people use very often anymore. But here's what it says. I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of the man who lacks judgment. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come out like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. The wisdom teacher never passed up an opportunity to warn about the dangers of laziness. And these, are, he, he, these were obvious signs of, of a distant, of, of an of a undisciplined life. If you were lazy and you procrastinated, We've talked about this before. In an agrarian society, you must live by the calendar. And if you don't take care of things, the calendar will catch up with you. It will overrun your place. And that's what had happened to this person. His ground was covered with weeds and his, the, the, things were out of control. <clears throat> I'll tell you that I'm talking about myself here. I'm at the end of my gardening season. And my tomatoes are about played out. My squash and my zucchini and my cucumbers, they're getting yellow and they're not producing anymore. And so I really haven't been as attentive to my garden as I should be. And there are weeds there. In fact, there are weeds that if I had taken care of them a week and a half ago, would have been easy hoeing. Now, not so quite. And they're not really choking off anything, but they're sure, certainly not helping anything. If you're lazy, and, and I don't know if I was a lazy or just, I said, I'm just going to let it go because I got other things to do, but it catches up with you. It allows these two character flaws to take over in your life, and if you do allow them to take over, then the things that you should be taking care of, those dangers will not get taken care of, and they will progress to the stage where they are irreversible. And that, that is not something that you want to see. So the writer of Proverbs it hits on those things whenever he gets an opportunity. Now I want you to go with me to chapter 25 in Proverbs. And we're going to talk about one of the most prominent subjects in Proverbs. It is the power of words and undisciplined tongues and what they can do to a person. Here begins the gathering of uh, the Proverbs by Hezekiah's men. It says, These are, the more, are more Proverbs of Solomon compiled by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. That's verse 1 of chapter 25. <clears throat> but we're going to skip down to verse 11 and go 11, 18, and 19. Talking about words. A word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Then he changes his tune. Like a club or a sword or a sharp arrow is the man who gives false testimony against his neighbor. Like a bad tooth or a lame foot, the reliance on the unfaithful is in times of trouble. That's what it's like if you rely on the unfaithful, the person who may tell a falsehood about you. The book of Proverbs 
speaks often about the immense power of words. In fact, in the section that we're looking at uh, from here to uh, pro approximately the end of the, of the book, uh, the, 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 the passages cover uh, words and their power. About 20% of the material deals specifically with what the power of words is. Many of the Proverbs deal with this theme, stress the negative impact of words and how vicious dishonest speech is. However, there is also language there that's good as well. And we'll look at that. Verse 11 in particular, the word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Uh, this, this word tries, makes a, a point of how powerful and beautiful words can be when they're delivered at the appropriate time and the meaning is understood. Uh, it, is, it is important sometimes to, to speak words uh, at the right time. The point here is that wise words delivered at the right time can achieve a godly purpose, but foolish words are deadly. Look at the damage here that can be done. Verse 18 talks about what these words are like. Clubs, it's a battle hammer. That was one of the things that they used in war in those days, as a battle hammer. You know, war was very personal in the day of, of the book of Proverbs. When you fought, you didn't fight from three or four miles away with artillery or rockets or whatever. You fought face-to-face -face in hand-to-hand -hand combat. A sharpened arrow, which could inflict great damage uh, in, in a person's body. Uh, a person who fabricates false testimony is using words just like you use these implements of battle. The defendant here had hoped that the testimony of this witness was going to vindicate him, set him free. Instead, the witness brings false testimony, false evidence that more or less guarantees that he's guilty. Instead of uh, being left an innocent man, He's frustrated, like a runner who wants to run a race, but he determines he's got an injury with his foot and he can't run it. Or someone who's sitting down to a wonderful meal and he takes his first bite and a molar breaks off in the back. Isn't that horrible? That's the kind of feeling that you get from those words the writer tells us here. <clears throat> it is not a wonderful feeling. And it is the damage that can be done by those kinds of words. Now, while we might not be involved in a, in a court case where someone is speaking untruths about us, today, because of the great technology that we have, and I say great with quotes around it, could be on Facebook or it could be on Twitter. Uh, people might say bad things about you that are not true. And because it's been put out there for everybody in the world to be able to see, it's hard to reverse. It's hard to change it. It's impossible to reverse because it, the damage has been done. Even if the person retracts it or they take it down, there will be people who've read it and repeated it. And so you can't bring it back. Those words do great damage. In addition to that, if they're... Any of you that have ever been a public official or served, in a, served in a, in a, as a public figure in some way, uh, maybe in education, as I have, uh, I was a principal and I was assistant superintendent, and people say bad things about you. They don't agree with you. And sometimes it gets in the newspaper. Sometimes it gets on television. And you know it's not true, but it's out there for everybody to hear. And then they get to evaluate. Words can destroy and words can become weapons is what the, the, the writer is saying here. You must be careful about how you use words. And then in Proverbs 26, uh, he talks about gossipers. We, we mentioned some verses that had to do with gossiping in our previous lesson uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, and in this situation he's talking about gossiping again chapter 26 verse 20 through 22 
Without wood, a fire goes out. Without a gossip, a quarrel dies down. As charcoal to embers and as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. Now, that last verse is probably familiar. The Proverbs have a way of repeating themselves. And this is one of those that's repeated. Here in chapter 26, we find a companion piece to, tw to verses 18 and 19 in chapter 25. These are a bit different, though, because <clears throat> they deal with the false testimony of a gossip. It's not out in the public, per se, like on a newspaper or on Facebook or Twitter. It is in one person's ear at a time. I want to tell you what I heard about Harry. And then ears perk up and you listen very carefully. And so the talebearer spreads a word and it is uh, slander. It's, it's slander that it, it, it brings out the most maliciousness and most malicious feeling in a person's character to carry out that slander. And it, it, the situation can be expanded and magnified by the words that are chosen. Uh, the picture here is of a person who's adding fuel to a fire. It might just be coals, but if you add something to the coals, like some more wood, it'll flame back up. I love to burn trash, not trash out of the kitchen, I'm talking about limbs and so forth out of the yard. And I put them there, and I, I'll have them in a pretty good-sized stack. And, and when I burn them, I get them down to a point, and I'll leave them. And I, I, I feel confident that they're not going to spread anywhere. But I might look back at that spot. It might be late in the evening, and I'll look back at the spot, and there's been something that happened that created some more fuel, maybe some more limbs kind of fell down as they were burning and they got, the fire got to the fuel and it flames back up. And then sometimes I'll go by and if I've got some embers left there, I'll put some more stuff on top of it and catch it on, on the fire. That's what gossip is like. You, f you, you add to the fire every opportunity that you get. A wise person does not add fuel to the fire of gossip. It may soon dissipate. If he does not, the fire will go out on its own. But the fool, the fool stokes the embers so that the flames will come up again. That's what a gossip does. And it's not what God intended for the use of words. And then the writer talks about flattery and deceit in verses 23 through 25. He says, like a coating of glaze over earthenware are fervent lips with an evil heart. A malicious man disguises himself with his lips, but in his heart he harbors deceit. Though his speech is charming, do not believe him, for seven admonitions fill his heart. Abominations, excuse me. Seven abominations fill his heart. This is an illustration of how flattery and deceit work. The example given at the beginning is a clay pot that's been glazed over with silver to make it look like it's something really, really expensive. And in reality, there's clay underneath a lining of silver, and it looks beautiful, but the value is greatly diminished because it's a clay pot. When you closely examine it, you learn what the what the difference is. So lips that appear to burn with love or concern about you, are, are, they, may, um, they may just be masking what this person has in their heart. The writer is saying here, from a practical standpoint, beware of someone who flatters you too much because that gracious speech that they're giving to you might just be a cover-up for attitudes of the most hateful kind toward you. It's what's in the heart 
that matters, not what's on the lips. And so the writer says, be cautious when the lips are too full of compliments. Then in uh, verse 26 down through 28, he says, malice, his malice may be concealed by deception, but his wickedness will be exposed in the assembly. If a man digs a pit, he will fall into it. If a man rolls a stone, it will roll back on him. A lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. This is an example, a picture of what happens to people who use the flattery and deceit that are mentioned in verses 23 through 25. They dig a hole sometimes, and the hole is a place that they fall, and it is a place that they may disappear. They may be pushing a stone, and instead of being able to get the stone where it wants to go, it rolls back on them, and it hurts them. A lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. You must be careful. These final three verses reveal the disastrous results of a multitude of evils that have been accomplished by the tongue. They, they try the, as, as he might. <clears throat> the perpetrator cannot escape, really, being caught in his lie. And, that, and for some of us, that should be enough. We walk away from those people. We walk away from a person who's a gossip, from a person who's trying to spread malicious rumors about someone else because their lies will find them out. Their duplicity will find them out. They, the reality is that they will be exposed and once they are exposed, once the whole community calls their bluff, then the community will deal with that person appropriately. They're going to fall into their own pit. It'll be their own making is what the person is saying. No court is necessary. The universe that's been made by God and operates at His orders will exact retribution from this person. It's not even required of the person who the gossip might be about to do anything. The universal rules that God's put into place will exact punishment on that person for what they've done. And then we're going to shift gears here a minute. Just several in a row of things here that I thought were, were good and I wanted to, to, to mention. The first one is in, in Proverbs 27, verse 1. And it says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. As soon as I read that verse, I thought about chapter 6 in Matthew, where Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount said, Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry. In fact, in verse 34 of chapter 6, he says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And isn't that true? Every day that I watch the news, it seems like more trouble on this day than the day before. Each day has enough trouble. So don't, don't boast about tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. And tomorrow has enough trouble of its own to deal with. And then verse 17. This is a verse that you hear a lot in today's uh, churches where there are men's group, groups that meet. And, and I think it applies to that. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Augustine said... One loving heart sets another on fire. What can you do as a mentor for someone else? When iron sharpens a blade, it gives it an edge, making it more useful, productive, more powerful. So mentoring, mentoring is the sharp iron of another person rubbing across the personality and the soul of a fellow and both spiritually and intellectually the the conversation helps to sharpen both refines the personality and the spirit of the person refreshing and renewing and reinforcing and restoring 
that person. That's what, what the, what the uh, writer of Proverbs is saying here, what the teacher is saying. You can be a mentor, and this can be for male or female. You can be a mentor to someone else. Your life rubbing across their life can help them through hard times. And then verse 19 says, A water, as water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. In those days, mirrors were polished metal, not the kind of mirrors we have today. I mean, and the kind of mirrors we have today are fabulous compared to what uh, was, was available to the people of this time. And so water, still water, <clears throat> was the best kind of mirror that they could have. And, and so this person says, we must look deep into the heart of a person if we're going to see who that person really is. Look deep. We must look deep into our own heart if we're going to see who we really are. Can we be honest with ourselves? It caused me to recall James 1, 23 and 24. And I like the J.B. Phillips translation of this. It reads like this. The man who simply hears and does nothing about it is like a man catching the reflection of his own face in a mirror. He sees himself, it is true, but he goes on with whatever he was doing without the slightest recollection of what sort of person he saw in the mirror. But the man who looks into the perfect mirror of God's word, the, the, the law of liberty or freedom, and makes a habit of so doing, is not the man who sees and forgets. He puts that law into practice, and he wins true happiness. Can you look into your own heart and see who you really are? Or are you just passing by the mirror and seeing the reflection and walking away and forgetting about it? The, the person who wants to go down the path, the person who wants to go the right way is a person who's constantly looking at himself and evaluating what he sees. He wants to know what his heart truly is like. And then in Proverbs 28, one other verse, he who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them, finds mercy. There, here we are. Were you looking for mercy and grace in Proverbs? Probably not, but here it is. He who confesses and renounces his sin, he will find mercy. Sin revealed, confessed to God, as always taken by God and forgiven. In fact, I, I love this, this verse that one of the commentators used from Micah 7, 19, that God throws that sin into the sea of forgetfulness and remembers it against him no more. That's what God does with our sin now. We've all sinned. We learned that in the book of Romans. We've all come short of the glory of God but if we confess our sin, God is gracious to forgive our sin. And when he forgives our sin, he remembers it no more. It's not for him to bring up again later on and say, I remember that, remember that sin? No, it's gone. It's away. That he conceals his sin does not prosper. But whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy with God. That, that's what we want to hear about. God's grace, ever present, ever ready to forgive sin. Now we come to the focal passage of these verses. I've just been kind of leading up to this. But the focal passage we find in chapter 29 and beginning with verse 1. And these passages are going to, come to, our passages are going to talk about what a disciplined life can do for us. 
disciplined in the way of a student learning, a child, disciplined in the way of a leader leading a nation, whatever it might be. <clears throat> Here's what he says in verses 1 through 4. A man who remains stiff-necked after many rebukes will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. When the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. A man who loves wisdom brings joy to his father, but a companion of prostitutes squanders his wealth. By justice, a king gives a country stability, but the one who is greedy for bribes tears it down. These verses deal with wicked rulers. Uh, verse 1 promises that one day, by some means, the wicked, in fact, will fall. I know that many of us are looking for that to happen soon. And I hope that it does. We have many wicked people in our world today. But the wicked will fall. The implicit warning here is that one should heed the rebukes when they are given. If you don't, you're going to be the victim of them. Verse 2 summarizes the whole. When society is good and is happy, when the evil rules, it's miserable. When society is good, society is happy. When evil rules, society is miserable. And guess what? When society is miserable, they're going to want to make a change. That's one of the rules of politics. You want everything to be going well when you run for an office, if you're an incumbent, really. If you're not uh, an incumbent, then the, the bad things can make your race look better. Uh, so... This, this pair of Proverbs here uh, hold up this idea that society, when it's, when it's good, people are happy. When it's not, they're not, and they're going to throw that ruler out. Verse 29. Whoever flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his feet. Chapter 29, verse 5. An evil man is snared by his own sin, but a righteous one can sing and be glad. The idea here is a trap or a snare that, that the evil man's iniquity is a trap or a snare. The righteous man runs on and is rejoiced. The evil man sets a trap. The righteous man is able to get past it. Flattery is a trap. The one who is righteous can see it and he avoids it. That's what, that's what we should all be able to do. If you look into your heart, and you're living like God wants you to live, He's going to enable you to see these traps that people put in front of you. And then chapter 29, verse 7, speaks about one of the recurring themes of Proverbs, the justice for the poor. The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concerns. Mockers stir up a city, but the wise turn away anger. If a wise man goes to court with a fool, the fool rages and scoffs, there is no peace. Bloodthirsty men hate a man of integrity and seek to kill the upright. A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. This is a comparison and contrast between fools and wise men. In, in the first part here, mockers create havoc, but the wise restore order in the second of uh, in verse 9 the wise have decorum while they're in court they understand how the rules work fools do not in verse 10 violent men hate the good the just seek justice for them and the wise have self-control fools do not in verse 11 so it's back and forth between mockers and between the wise. They, the wicked, not only violate God's way, they joke about it. And their wickedness and their mocking uh, for all who try to live uprightly, their crude, rude lack of judgment attacks the integrity of the entire community and sets loose all the tensions and strains that are present. Setting a city aflame is based on the picture of blowing on embers of coal to spark them into a fire. Unfortunately, we see those kinds of things going on today. We see cities literally 
being set aflame. And I'm not sure what the resolution to that's going to be. But I know that in the end, the righteous wisdom will prevail. I hope we'll see it in our lifetime. Then in chapter 29, verses 12 through 14. If a ruler listens to lies, all his officials become wicked. The poor man and his oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives sight to the eyes of both. If a king judges the poor with fairness, his throne will always be secure. And these are all short, independent statements. A king or a president or any chief executive officer must set a high standard and rigorously maintain it. If he does not, look what happens. It says, if the ruler listens to lies, all of his officials become corrupt. They become wicked. The poor are no less than anybody else in God's image. They have God as their avenger and their protector. And then the, the, the security of the king's reign depends on an equitable dispensation of justice. If the king judges the poor with fairness, his throne will always be secure. And they use the poor as the standard. If the king judges the poor correctly, then his throne is going to be secure. Those are all independent statements standing on their own. And then next, we get into the training of children, the training of the next generation. I want to start that off by looking at, at a statement uh, that uh, comes from uh, Mr. Hubbard, who writes commentary on Proverbs. This is what he says. It is a hard thing, or it is hard for youngsters to rise above the levels of behavior practiced by their elders who have the most influence upon them. Where do kids learn violence, selfishness, profanity, deception, greed, explosive anger? In the same vein, where do children learn to be giving or loving, kind or generous, selfish or truthful, even-tempered or brave? The answer is not simple, but it is important. And so here's what our writer has to say about training children in the way that they should go. First, he says, the rod of correction imparts wisdom. But a child left to himself disgraces his mother. In other words, you've got to give guidance. And the rod here is a personification of the discipline that you must instill in young people that you're training. It takes discipline to gain knowledge and understanding. And what they're really talking about here <clears throat> is not the discipline of a parent standing over a child, directing their every move. It is teaching a child self-discipline because self-discipline is the best form of discipline. It is filled up with routines that lead to habits and habits that lead to a way of approaching tasks and challenges in life. Without self-discipline, the direction that parents give will go away and be of no benefit later in life when parents are no longer around to assist in establishing a path that leads to learning. I've seen that so often as a teacher. I can tell which students have already begun to have the self-discipline that it takes to, to learn. And then that's probably easier to see in a high school setting, but it's disappointing to see in a high school setting also that students haven't learned that, that you have to stay after them, you have to stay with them, and you have to stay encouraging them to follow and do the right thing. Wisdom is something that comes slowly, but it's gained in a multitude of ways. There are many, many ways. Young people listen to their parents and they listen to their teachers and we hope they're saying the right thing. They listen to wisdom's call. There's something inside of you that says, I want to understand life better. I, I, I want to know what to do and become a part of me. They learn it by fearing God. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs that fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. 
by observing the effects of good and bad conduct. That's, that's only, uh, you know, practical sense. If you act this way, there's one reaction that comes. If you act another way, there's another reaction, and it's more positive. And so you want those kinds of rewards that might come out of that. An even more practical source of wisdom is to be scolded and corrected with the reinforcement of some type of punishment. That's what the writer's saying here. Don't spare the rod, spoil the child. That's not in this, but it's in another part of Proverbs. And the rod is not necessarily a physical rod. It's simply the personification of wisdom. And here's one thing that, that I have seen so often as a teacher is that parents give up on their children too quickly. They don't have the perseverance that's required. And so consequently, the child doesn't learn perseverance from their parent. Maybe they'll learn it from a fellow student. Maybe they'll learn it from the teacher or a coach or someone else. But they need to learn it from someone that learns to self-discipline uh, and, and to, to not require somebody to be looking over their sh shoulder. But in the beginning, there's got to be that parent who does those kinds of things. In fact, if, if you look at the parenting that's talked about in Proverbs, and I'm not going to show you all these scriptures, but just mention some of the things that, 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 that are talked about there. Beginning even in Proverbs 1, it says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and to your mother's teaching. In Proverbs 4, it again says, Listen to your father's instruction, pay attention, and gain understanding. I give you sound learning. It says, Lay hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands, and you will live. Verse chapter 6, Keep your father's commands, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Over and over and over again, you have God watch over, speak to you. They are a lamp for you. They are a light to you. Their corrections of discipline are good for you. They are the way of life. And if you follow after that, then you'll become a delight to them. And you will begin to love wisdom. And you will produce children that love wisdom and follow after that. The parent's discipline of their child is an expression of love because the Lord disciplines those that he loves, the Bible tells us. As a father, the son, he delights in. If you don't discipline them, you're not loving them. You have to love them. And many of us, our children are already gone. And we watch our children with their children. And we want to see that they're doing the right thing. And, 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 and my hope is that they are. So what is the, the outcome of all of this? And I think it comes down to the last verse in our focal passage. That last verse reads like this. I'm going to read it to you out of two versions. The first is out of the NIV. It says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. And then out of the King James, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So you heard that verse before? Where there is no vision, the people perish. Without a vision, the verse is saying, people cast off restraint. Uh, that, that they do not follow spiritual insight. They become unrestrained. When we think about the need for a revelation, that means we need somebody who can tell us about God, about what God wants us to do, and help us to listen to God and to focus our thoughts on Him and help us to direct our energy toward according uh, to His purposes. In the Old Testament days, God's people heard from him through the preaching of the prophets. And you don't hear prophets mentioned that much in the book of Proverbs, but here's one instance where they are. Where there is no preaching of the prophets, 
where there is no spiritual direction, the people perish because they cast off restraint. They cast off directions to life and they stray from the path. They stray from the way and they go off to destruction. And that's not what we want. They, the, the prophets of the Old Testament were the spiritual eyes of the nation. They were the ones who could see what God wanted his people to do. God's people grew more disciplined as they gave their full attention to his instruction. Moses, the greatest of the prophets of the Old Testament, what did he bring into the lives of the people? He brought rules, the Ten Commandments, and then the Levitical Code, and many others. He taught them how to live wisely and how to understand. God's people grow more disciplined as they follow, follow the instruction of the prophets. Why do we come to church? We come to church not just for fellowship, but we come, we come to church for instruction. I, I don't think there's a sermon that I've ever heard that I didn't learn something from it. It might have been in a negative way, but most often it's a positive way. It focuses my attention on God and God's wisdom. And that's what God wants me to do. He wants me to focus my attention on Him, not on myself. He wants me to focus my attention on Him. Spiritual insight from the Lord and instruction in His Word nourish the heart of believers. We need spiritual instruction. And when, when you don't have spiritual instruction in your life, if you're not a part of a Bible study group, such as we are part of here in this online way today, you're not a part of a, of a worship gathering where there, there is a, a person, a preacher, a prophet who's speaking God's word, then you're going to begin to deteriorate. You're not going to be living in the kind of wisdom that God wants you to live in. The proverb here is not referencing the absence of a vision or a goal. It is, it is, it is something totally different. It is uh, something that, that, that we don't often think of. Listen to what one writer said the bottom line is about this. Without a vision from God, man remains in spiritual darkness and ignorance. We must pray laborers into the unevangelized places of this world. Happy is the person who hears and receives the gospel unto salvation. We need to spread the word, is what this person is saying. We need to spread the word of the gospel. Because without the gospel, people won't know the way. And without us drawing our attention to the gospel on a regular basis, we can lose our way. We will lose our path. We don't want to do that. We want to stay on the path. And so there's a call that comes to us. One, to hear the gospel. And two, to share the gospel. There's a call that comes to us that says, we must be part of a sharing of the gospel, whether it's physically or through gifts that we give or through prayers that we raise. We must be called to share the gospel. And it reminds me of that old hymn that we've sung so many times. And I hope I'm in good enough voice to share it with you today. You sing it with me and maybe you'll drown out <clears throat> my voice that seems to be going away. And it goes like this. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue 
their souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the precious gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. May this be our ultimate call to send the light, the light of the gospel. Because with the light of the gospel, we're walking down the path that God wants us to walk. And we're, we're bringing other people into the way to walk with us. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful today. We're grateful for the life uh, that was given to us through your son, Jesus Christ, so that he could become the example. And his life is the gospel. And his way is the gospel. May we be able to walk that way ourselves and invite other people to walk down that path with us. It's so true, Father. Where there is no vision, the people perish. May we keep our vision, and may we not perish. For we ask in thy Son's name. Amen. Have a good week.